whenever we start the design of any product, it's who is the actual user, what are they going to use it for, what are the use modes, whatever else, and make sure that it's really good to do whatever that task is. And so everything through and through from the choice of steel to the uh, material types to the geometry, the colors and, and the textures and all that kind of thing should speak to that user so that even at a distance, you know, someone can tell what it's used for. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 112 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting, hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives. The Knife Junkie Podcast has you covered, and our Sunday interview show today, that's what we're talking about today, Bob, and uh, a, a brand that I have only heard of as SOG, but I learned during this interview there are several different names. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can call it SOG, you can call it SOG, or you can call it what they're really kind of pushing for right now, which is Studies and Observations Group, uh, which is the uh, sort of clandestine group that uh, the SOG knife company was uh, first based on uh, when it was created. It was, it was created around the SOG knife an iconic double-humped Bowie-style uh, military blade that was created for the Studies and Observations Group, which was a small uh, unit that went into Vietnam and checked things out before, uh, before major U.S. forces went in there. And uh, their knife is legendary. SOG was created uh, around recreating that knife uh, for a new knife market in the, uh, in the 80s. And uh, boom, SOG's been around ever since. And uh, They've been very big. They've made folders for years that you could buy literally anywhere. And now they want to turn that around. They want to take the SOG brand away from knives for people who need knives uh, to knives for people who love and appreciate knives for very specialized purposes. Uh, so today we're talking with Jonathan Wegner, and uh, he's the gentleman responsible for the rebranding of the Studies and Observation Group. SOG or SOG. Right. I call him SOG. Yep. And a uh, very interesting guy. And his approach worked. What can I say? Uh, I've tried out three of the knives so far from the redesign. And uh, I'm very, very pleasantly surprised and <laughs> impressed. Right. Jonathan Wagner, the vice president of brand at uh, SOG Knives and uh, definitely got into uh, a lot of conversation about uh, the branding and the marketing and kind of Bringing the company back to what it once was, I guess, is a, mm -hmm. is a good way to say it. So that uh, that interview with Jonathan is coming up next. But first, I want to remind you that our show today is brought to you by the Get Upside app. It's your way to get cash back on gas purchases. Get Upside uh, is an app, again, that you just put on your smartphone whenever you need to get gas. You search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up the tank, then just take a picture of the receipt with your phone. That's it. You've earned cash back. Get the app on your phone now at theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Again, theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. I'm here with Jonathan Wegner of the legendary American Knife Company, named after the fabled Studies and Observations Group. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Yeah, real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. And and before we go any further, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I've always said SOG. I've heard people say SOG and, and also just broken out into studies and observations group. What do you prefer personally? Personally, I don't think it really matters uh, because I've heard it all. And, uh, you know, coming from Australia, I, I heard it pronounced a couple of different ways because, you know, we're so far away uh, from its origin. But uh, when I came on board, there's actually something I looked into and I found there's kind of a split between East Coast, West Coast, and then kind of like Middle America, there's was, was just like all these different ways to say it. So in the South, we heard a lot of SOG. Um, on on North uh, West and Pacific Northwest, there's uh, SOG that you know ultimately comes from Mackety SOG, uh, the the acronym, um, and then the house pronounced from the Special Forces Group that that Spencer Fraser you know named the company in honor of. We're going to talk a lot about this rebranding, yeah. That you have spearheaded. 
explain what inspired that. What what was the song that you inherited and what were you looking to evolve it into? Yeah, so even before I started, the, the CEO, Joe McSweeney, um, he'd been brought on to just change where, where the business was going. And we had elements within the organization like Barry McKay, our head of product uh, development, and Chris Cashbar, um, who's been in the company for like 12, 15 years now. Um, they, they all were sort of dissatisfied with where we were going. Um, we were very fragmented, unfocused. Um, I think, unfortunately, we have this bad rap now for doing all this low-end stuff um, that ended up in, in Walmart. Can I just say for the record, we are no longer in Walmart. We have been since last year. So quit <laughs> posting that on our, on our uh, social feeds. Um, but ultimately, it distracted us from doing what we used to do really well, uh, which was create user-focused and user insights-led products that were sort of mid to, mid to higher end. So when I came on, I found Sog was really a, a uh, innovation hub. I mean, there's so many patents that are attributed to Spencer Fraser and Baron McKay and, and, and others within the organization. And then, you know, there, there was this kind of long ongoing user insights led approach to, to product development. So I, I felt that those were two really key things to, to grasp upon that, that told us great why story behind, you know, what SOG is capable. And so, you know, that, that innovation allows us to make better things for, for the end users. And so it kind of led to this, this mantra that we have that we want to provide enhanced capabilities for human potential. So, we, we took this approach of um, not just looking at our past, but also looking way past beyond that of thinking about, you know, what is it that we actually do? Like, what is our core? Why? Sure, we have, we're now known for like edge tools and other types of tools and gear, but what has led to any company doing that? So we went way, way, way back and thought about what are the things that propelled humanity for, for millennia? And it's the perpetuation of knowledge and it's the perpetuation of utilizing tools to continue to, to advance the potential of humanity. So that, that kind of was this kind of gelling moment of taking all these disparate things and starting to create this focus for us. And um, all these elements led to us wanting to live by that at every single level. So that's why we got out of the, the lower end stuff and we decided to focus on work with users to make them better. I mean, the, the whole insight is... And the reason we have knives this day is that, you know, knives are far better at doing many things that we can do with our teeth than our nails. And you know, that's why backpacks exist and elimination because it enhances us. So it's just, you know, it's kind of stupid looking back at how simple that, that insight is, but it, it really is driving everything that we do. So ultimately, you know, what led to it is that we wanted to do things much better and be an actual useful extension of people's capabilities in their day to day, be it you know, in a professional sense or recreational in the outdoors or daily. Something that occurs to me or has occurred to me over uh, the past uh, six months, I'd say, watching the rollouts and checking out the videos from SHOT Show, uh, checking these out on the web, is that the shift seems to be moving back towards knife people as well as people who just need a knife. And maybe maybe now even not so much for people who just need a knife. It kind of seems to be... Uh, thinking a little bit more about the person who appreciates the tool itself, which is always welcome. You know, you're talking to someone who, whose moniker is Knife Junkie. I love, I love when uh, a company or a maker or a designer is doing what you're saying, being nimble enough to listen to what, what people actually want and incorporating it in, into your vision. You mentioned uh, looking at user groups and user demographics, and I've read a, a bit about during this rebranding, you've, you've broken it into three different user types. So what are those user types? Yeah, um, professional users. So in with that thinking, uh, when they have a piece of our gear out, a knife, a multi-tool, whatever it is, that is the primary tool that they're using for that task. Um, so it needs to be very focused on, on what it does. Uh, for outdoor users, there is some portion of that, but it's more about recreational outdoor use, even if it's very focused. So... You might have your ultra lightweight backpacker, for example, who they're all about pushing the boundaries of self and really finding where the, the edges of, of their potential is to, you know, for all means and purposes, are, you know, they're, they're professional athletes. Or you have those that are, that are more adventure focused where it's about being social. 
Um, and then on the daily side, which I think a lot of us fall in, where there are probably better tools out there, but you know, it's it's an often said statement that the best tool is the tool that you have on you. So it's it's appealing to those people that every day when they walk out of the house or even when they're in the house, they make a very deliberate decision on what they're going to take with them because that could mean the uh, potential for their mission failure or success, be it the mission of, you know, cutting a loose thread, as I think an example that you've used many times, or, you know, uh, uh, fastening and fixing something. But, you know, with them, it it could get to these extremes where it's about protection and self-defense and those sorts of things. But we want to offer um, solutions for those people depending on, you know, what their mindset is, what the level of preparation, and offer very precise tools so that makes their selection easy. So those are three. We, you know, as a professional outdoor daily. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of three of the new redesigns of the classics, the Trident, the Aegis, and the um, Flash. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, beautiful, beautiful redesigns, I have to say. And those are three classics that should stay, you know, in the, in the Pantheon. Mm-hmm. But the way they've been redesigned, they could cross over. I mean, I could easily see the sure. Trident uh, being a, a daily carry. I like larger knives and I tend yeah. towards the, the tactical in, in aesthetic. They they all seem to cross over. Obviously, they'd all be capable outdoors, and they'd all be capable in a, in the professional's hands. He just might not want a yellow flash. That's all. Yeah, I mean, no disagreement. And um, the approach that we take is, and I'll use an example just for a second of what kind of led to this thinking is um, my background is is design, and I've always really wanted to give people very precise solutions for what they're after. And so my approach quite often is I, I want whatever we are developing to be really good at least at one thing and anything beyond that is a bonus. So whenever we start the design of any product, it's who is the actual user, what are they going to use it for, what are the use modes, whatever else, and make sure that it's really good to do whatever that task is. And so everything through and through from the choice of steel to the uh, material types to the geometry, the colors and, and the textures and all that kind of thing should speak to that user so that even at a distance, you know, someone can tell what it's used for and, and so on and so forth. But just because it does that doesn't mean that no one else should touch it. It's just we want to ensure that it does that one thing really well. And if you're into that, carry it. Like, I mean, for example, um, I'm, you know, my daily carry right now is Sogtac XR or Vision uh, XR, mm-hmm. which they, they're coming out in June. But even though they're in a professional category, I love them for the feel, the look, the weight, and ultimately – we pick things because they're extensions of our personality. And, right. um, you know, I, I like black things. And so, you know, even with the, <laughs> the new stuff that we've released with, with Flash and Aegis, we've had people saying, make it in black. And like, yeah, sure, we'll do that. But let's, let's start off with, you know, providing something that feels more like an extension of that user set to begin with. Yeah, Sog has been doing black and gray and silver for a long time. Yeah. And, and if, you're, <laughs> if you, if you want to make a definitive shift in your brand identity, yeah, maybe a season without black is, is warranted. Even the, even the yellow and the red handled flashes with the black blade would just look, look yeah. incredible. But still, I, I, I totally get where that's coming from. So, uh, in terms of what people will actually see, we're all familiar with Sog. Mm. Just because uh, a lot of us have been collecting knives for a long time. I, by the way, have four. I have the Super Sog Bowie. I've always been a huge fan of the yeah. of the fixed blades. I keep a, a seal, an old seal pup in my backpack. So in a way, that's a daily carry. I have this uh, old from 1991 that I got when I was in art school in Boston. Can't buy a knife in Boston now, I'm sure. Yeah. And then the new Kiku XR, which is yeah. a little beast. I love this knife. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but what are what are people going to be seeing? Uh, they're all familiar with SOG because SOG's been around a long time. And if you've been in the knife hobby for a long time, you're familiar with it. How is it going to look different from the outside and then move on the inside? What innovations have you made? Yeah, so we've, we've been probably in the last even decade, uh, there's been a lot of uh, push on the innovation side from the mechanical uh, design standpoint. And the reason you haven't seen a lot of the new mechanical designs is because we haven't been able to, until recently, in the last two, three years, find manufacturing partners that, that can actually manufacture, which um, in certain instances has precluded us from being able to manufacture in the US. Um, I, I'll, I'll say, say for the record that there is a desire to increase manufacturing in the US uh, for, for many different reasons. But, um, you know, 
ultimately we had to take manufacturing from certain items away from Japan and shift it to Taiwan uh, because you know we'd show a lot of these mechanisms even in their CAD form to the manufacturing They're like we don't know how to build that so hmm. there is there's been a lot of innovation on the mech design side and you'll see much more of that we have we work three to five years out uh, with product planning so all the things I'm really excited right now you know are going to be in the public's eye until uh, <laughs> you know it's the first things I'm really excited about is you know fall 2021 and um, you know, and onwards but we're starting off with really I don't want to say fixing but taking a lot of our favorite and trusted products to the to, you know in line with where we're going with the brand so Vision, Pentagon, Sogtac, um, Ultra, you know, all of these are uh, upgrades in terms of mechanisms and design and material types. You know, D2 uh, tool steel right now is kind of going to be sort of like our standard entry level, if you will, mm-hmm. with XHP and S35VN as sort of the, the, the higher end. And then we're looking at other types of steels. Um, but again, fit for purpose, you know, finding the right steel type for the right application and all that sort of thing. You'll see. Updates to things like LA Nation line and our uh, pack line, but reframed. So they're far more deliberate in what they're trying to do. We, we had a pack line that continues to sell really well. But back to kind of your comment on things with black and silver and whatever else. But um, the reason we really pushed Aegis Flash and tried to part visually was so, you know, they, they had more purpose because previously you line them all up and say, pick one. People <laughs> you're like, um, they're all black, they're all silver. What's this one for? And it became more of a choice on geometry than really capability or the, the right reason for, for it being in that person's pocket. So lots of, lots and lots of updates and then really pushing the boundaries, um, on, you know, what the expectations around tools and knives and everyday carry are for, um, our core users and then looking on how we can provide those capabilities to those that don't think of themselves as EDC people. Like our, our history is such that in the last decade, we kind of really spread out really broadly mm. with our mm. products and got into lots of people's hands. So if anything was a benefit in the last decade is that while we went really cheap and really cheerful, it got a tool that is still useful into lots of people's hands. I'm, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you, but but uh, from, from your designer's eye, mm-hmm. um, what and, and I'm not asking, uh, you know, to besmirch the old product because they're awesome. They just needed to change they needed to to update but from your designer's eye what what did you look at and say these are the things that that definitely aren't uh, you know going to be uh carried on to the new uh the new iteration of sog style for style's purpose and nostalgia for as a selling tool so there was a lot of application of this is sog's way and it has to be tactical and sometimes it could be tactical <laughs> um and that's that's the sog way black aggressive all that kind of thing and then applied as a hunting tool or your everyday carry it's kind of like you get a lot of uh brands out there uh that that might state things like you know this is this is the perfect tool for doing everything and you're kind of like well not really like you know i can't take a fixed blade into a conference room and wear it on (laughs) a belt you know and various kind of things so it's really sort of adapting uh to, to each user and why and who and how and all that kind of stuff that we sort of already touched on so we're getting away from the, the black and silver kind of thing. The other thing is there's a lot of application of materials or geometries um, that really try to play off nostalgia. And quite often you don't see actual benefits to users from that. And Give me an example. Um, you know, I think the buoy, the, the classic Western type buoy that is repeated again and again and again. And you'll see with uh, our future products, not to give it away, but... Um, You'll see an interpretation of that, but it is really pushed towards the future as heavily as we, we can go with it being a useful generational leap as opposed to, you know, just a item to fill a spot on the shelf right. because right. we think that you can make some money. Yeah. So I have to say in the, in the redesign of the Trident, that is most evident because you have, you've always had the classic SOG double humped back, uh, buoy, which I love. I love the shape of it, always have. But what you've done is you've removed one of the humps and, and basically made the second hump uh, where where the thumb kind of goes yeah. over the top. So there is a, a, a tip of the hat to that old design, but it's definitely not uh, 
you know, you can see that it's a SOG and yeah. in, in you can see the DNA, but it's not uh, in your face anymore. Um, just on that sort of secondary sort of concave shape, you'll see, you know, we've um, changed the yes. position of the safety and you still get that secondary hump, but it's now f- useful as a functional element. So when the safety is, is up, it's locked in place and it becomes an additional thumb stop. So um, oh, oh, in the backward uh, in trajectory the back. or. Yeah. So we, we've had a lot of criticism on safeties. I mean, every manufacturer does like, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, this is this my, safety. Here's my safety. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, okay, how do we how do we make that actually useful to people? So one, how do you make it so you can use it with both hands? So every single product from here on out is ambidextrous, not because we love our lefties, um, but because sometimes your your uh, primary hands, your strong arm, is going to be holding something. It's going to be incapacitated. So you want that same muscle memory to flow through to regardless which hand you're going to be Mm -hmm. interfacing with. And you also want the safety to be in a place if you so choose to use it, that you can operate it very quickly and easily. So that's why I put on the spine. That's why we've made it kind of just a really easy rocker switch. And also, once it is open, um, you know, it becomes a thumb stop. So it actually has a functional benefit for for being there, so it prevents slippage. So there's lots of little things like that that have gone into it that, um, you know, are uh, kind of, nods of the hat back to our origin, but they are actually functional uh, yes. organizations. Uh, another thing that you did that I think is a great idea is put the glass breaker on the front right near the uh, the Ricasso instead of in the back because in reverse grip, and that that's a black uh, – what do you call that? That's a, an operator class uh, knife. Uh, a professional knife. Professional. Yeah. Uh, you might have need to uh, stab into something to extract someone or whatever, and you you might have that thumb up there, and to have a glass breaker there mm. is a very painful thing. So I love the yeah. placement of that. You have that slot for feeding um, cord or uh, seat belts through to cut. I always thought that was kind of a a, mm. a, a nice touch. So in the uh, in the Aegis, that is now kind of firmly in the outdoor line. And uh, to me, that was a always a perfect all arounder. That could that yeah. could uh, that design could could flex anywhere. Tell me about what you were focused on in turning this into a more outdoorsy knife. So we found the flat grind to, to be perfectly suited for more general purpose use um, in, in the outdoors. And um, you'll see some colorways later on that you know for those that want a black black version, uh, there's going to be one <laughs> like that. But um, it also was, I think, for the most part, one of the friendlier versions of uh, the, the uh, Trinity, if you want to call it that, of Flash Eaters and Trident. So we felt it was a perfect platform to really allow us to push a little bit harder into the outdoor space in um, allowing people that aren't knife people, so people that have just bought their pair of salamons and indigo and acid yellow for i mean i know this is a, an audio only podcast yeah. but the, the the one that we've just released is in this dark navy blue that we call indigo with a really bright pop of acid yellow Beautiful. which is you know something that you're going to see a lot in the outdoor industry so we want to create connections with people and a level of comfort through more rounded shapes and uh, friendlier colors that start to get people that would never consider to, to carry a knife on them to you know, start to connect with these tools that I think we all appreciate the, the benefit of every single day. So we, we've got kind of a duality where we want to provide something incredibly useful to people that, that are already kind of knowledgeable in the EDC space, but also provide kind of a bridge to, to those that have not yet considered or yet uh, felt comfortable to bridge that space. It's like doing this rebranding is is two things. It's it's like attracting new mates, but it's also uh, reaffirming your vows, <laughs> with yes. the, you know, at the same time. And uh, so you want the people who've been buying your knives to remember that you're still there and you're and you're concerned and you're pushing things forward and giving us new things that we're interested in. But you're also looking to to take new ground and territory. What, what demographic are you are you reaching out to? Would you say? Um. I think demographic. So I'm a long time marketer. So uh, apologies if I use terms that are just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, like what, what the hell is he talking about? Um, we, we go after more sort of psychographics, if you will, um, mm-hmm. which is uh, more about use modes. So even though we have these kind of three verticals, if you want to call them, or three use groups, um, we believe our products are more about use case as a as opposed to user. So, for example, the you know the the thing that I talk about when I introduce 
uh, new employees or uh, new salespeople to, to the brand and how we want to be perceived is that, for example, you might have an FBI uh, hostage rescue team guy that carries a very specific tool on his vest for a very specific purpose. He knows what's going to go down when he does a no-knock warrant, for example. So he has that on him, never used for anything except for when he needs to pull it out to, for example, someone struggling with his secondary uh, firearm and he's got to cut them away or whatever it might be that, that's going on. So very fit for a specific purpose, whereas he may also have in his truck something from our daily collection, for example, um, that you know is more sort of it's a little bit cheaper, it's a little bit lesser grade steel, it's more of a knock around kind of thing. But then when he goes ultra lightweight backpack hunting on, on the weekends, he carries a ultralight type uh, tool for um, you know breaking down the animal. But then there's another opportunity where he's getting his niece or nephew a, a gift, and so he gets something from more the adventure side of, of the outdoors. So it's more about use modes rather than is you are this person and you'll only buy from this this category. So um, that's the way we like to think about you know, the, the tools and sort of the, the psychographics, if you will, mm -hmm. rather than you are this person, therefore this is only for you. And as you yourself probably know, you will mix and match based on what you're doing, where you're going, how you feel that day. Yeah. So it, we're trying to blend a lot of these things and really understand how people actually think and use their, their tools. Uh, I'm pretty shallow. Openly, I'll tell people, you know, I will, I will say, what knife am I going to wear? I mean, carry today. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll look at my, my collection and choose uh, oftentimes just based on what I want to look at, what I want to open up and, and what I hope I get to use because I live a very, you know, suburban office dad life. So I see uh, the, the new redesigned knives actually reaching out to, uh, and now I am I, I am drawing a line and saying I am not what I am about to describe. <laughs> As a younger, like kind of stylish, uh, urban, I, I could see it. You know, if if the city allows it, uh, that you know, heaven forbid, you're allowed to carry a knife. I see it as like a kind of a younger city vibe too to some of them, the daily carry especially, because everyone needs a knife whether they know it or not. They need they have to have something, and 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 if you're going to pull it out and use it because you have it, it may as well be a non-threatening you know, good looking, fun product that might enhance, uh, not enhance, uh, might uh, entice other people. Like, oh, I don't have a pocket knife. And look at that. It's, it's, it's yellow and it comes out really sweet. And that's kind of neat. You know, why not throw it in my bag or whatever? Yeah. It's, it's why I really admire newer knife makers like Ryan Coulter over at the James and Rick and Deiris over at Burnside Knives. I mean, they're both, one's a for current Nike employee. I hope I don't get in trouble. One's a former Nike employee and really understand you know, that there is more people that could benefit of these tools than just kind of like, I think, unfortunately, that we also get kind of get um, bundled into this uh, stereoty stereotypical um, bucket of like, you have to be a hunter or a tactical guy or whatever mm -hmm. else. And unfortunately, you know, we're pushing against the forces of sort of the, the popular media um, stereotyping us that way. So, you know, I see a lot of, these things are opportunities to evangelize to, to others that, you know, just kind of gloss over the, the benefits that, that our tools offer, could potentially offer them as knife makers, tool makers, gear makers um, in general. I, I feel like SOG was a wonderful opportunity as a designer uh, uh, to, to take something uh, that, that has a great pedigree behind it but really get to reshape it because, you know, and I've, I've always loved the brand, as I mentioned before, especially the fixed blades. But now, now that I have this Kiku XR, my thoughts on the, uh, on, on the folders have radically shifted. But what, what my point is, is I, I really feel like for a while, especially with the folder design, and then it crept into the fixed blade, like some, some of the seal pups were looking pretty doggy, I gotta say. Yeah. There were some they lost their compass. What, what can I say? It was just SOG yeah. everywhere, you know, and that, I, I know you got uh, user feedback, but that didn't mean they were bad knives. They just, they got a little tacky or something. And, and what a great opportunity to, to put your eye to it and to, and to get, gather around. No doubt you have a group of talented designers with you and, and, to, and to take user inner, you know, input and really make it something new and great. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, just one thing I definitely want to share is that it absolutely is a team effort. 
it's uh, it does it certainly starts off with our, our users who have been critical of us and fairly. Um, I, I think it also demonstrates that um, sort of a side lesson for any business owners out there that are looking to expand their team or bring in investment. Really look at you know what those people have done before. Um, if you are a company that is looking to expand to the next level, really consider what those um, people that you bring in are going to do with your company because ultimately you want everyone that's in the organization living to your mission but also know what your mission is so that there is a mm. you know you, you have to kind of find that compass and actually establish i mean what i what i did prior to, to sog was uh, for the last 10 years is work with businesses to find their why and then establish it across every single part of the business uh really integrating marketing with design with sales with you know through and through so everyone's pointing the same direction so um you know sometimes you want to take a shortcut and get somewhere but by bringing people in but they all you know we we will do it we all you know go to the experiences we've had in the past and if every problem looks like a nail you know you're gonna you're gonna have it at down so um you know i think that that's what what occurred in the last decade and um they, they leveraged the brand beyond where it could actually sort of survive but um Thankfully, there is this group of people within the organization that really wanted to push it back. Spencer Fraser, you know, uh, was definitely one of them, and he appreciated where the previous management took it. But, you know, we, he, as I think you're aware, he retired this year from full time active service within mm-hmm. SOG and is more sort of focused on the innovation side now. But, you know, the reason he felt comfortable to step back was because we were starting to take it in this new direction, and he felt it was more aligned with, with where he began. Well, I think the criticism shows that people care because otherwise they drop off the map and just be, oh, forget about these guys. We're going off somewhere else. So uh, that that's one way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, that was that was actually – so prior to starting with, with Sog, I, um, I queried a bunch of people like, you know, what is this company I'm getting involved with? And a lot of active duty military, retired, law enforcement, um, you know, just more EDC people. And the thing was, the conversation always went along the lines of, I love SOG, but I love SOG from five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever mm-hmm. that, that golden period was. But the thing that always came up was, you know, I trust, I trust them. So it was a great starting point. And it's a heck of a lot easier than some of the brands I've, I've worked with in the past mm-hmm. where, you know, they deteriorated trust at every single level. But here there was kind of like this, you know, I still kind of think about SOG in this way. And so, you know, a lot of that led to to you know where we've gone now so um it's been really heartening to, to see that people still give a damn so hopefully we can actually give back and actually win people back with with what we're doing now so we'll see we'll see what happens i mean it's, it's ours to lose right so with what you've learned in particular working in the knife mm. industry in rebranding sog what would you tell uh as as i'm sure you know um you know this is an industry that's um teeming with custom makers and 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 designers who have uh, OEM knives produced and it's a it's a broad industry with a lot of small makers and small companies from working with a large company what are some what is some scalable advice that you could give people in particular about the knife industry in terms of branding i think a key a key component would, would be work out why you even exist and why you're doing what you're doing because there's so much overlap and um, I think that SOG decided to become very guilty of, of doing it too. But, um, you know, I recently listened to your Ernie Emerson um, episode and, mm-hmm. you know, he, he knows his why. He's, he's really about that brutal functionality. And I use the term brutal in, in the most loving way. Um, mm-hmm. He is just so focused on that and everything he does, even the research he does into, you know, finding the very best technologies that have been passed on and on for generations because they just work and his application of it. And that's what he stands for. And I think he stands true to it. And there's a lot of brands out there that just are good ideas in a physical form, but is there a story, you know, beyond I made this because it looks cool and because I could make it. Like, um, yeah, my, my recommendation, if you want to survive in the long term, especially with what's going on in the world right now, um, with COVID-19 and everything else putting a lot of pressure on um, every industry and really causing uh, the likes of us to really be selective of where we, you know, 
where we put our dollars. I think the dollars are going to go to brands that are brands as opposed to a single product or, a, or an idea. So people buy into the story behind it and want to know why something's been done and, and whatever else. And that adds and gives longevity beyond that. So I, I think that that would be the key advice, really, really work out why you exist and, you know, really stick by it and make sure you don't take the, the sog route of, yeah, we, we exist to make black and silver knives and we'll just put that application across everything. So, you know, I think that we're a model of what happens when you, when you lose your way. Huh. Interesting. That's meta advice. Just figure out your own existence. <laughs> so COVID-19 and, and the uh, recent pandemic and, and everything, yeah. how has that affected SOG? How has it affected the rebranding and the rollouts? And, and are you, um, uh, uh, how, how have some of your products been a part of this effort? Yeah, that's a million um, questions. <laughs> that's okay. I'm, I'm happy to answer all those. So for the most part, it's been business as usual, and if anything, we've seen a massive influx of people that um, you know want to be prepared and first time buyers is coming to us and asking questions and um, you know getting a lot of gear from us. So it, it hasn't been bad. It, it certainly has uh, depressed retail sales, um, but online has has kind of picked up uh, to to sort of balance it out a little bit. But for the most part, there's business continuity because we're all working from home, so working on new projects besides, you know, the challenges of having, you know, three-year-olds running around and, um, you know, it's, it's, it, that's been a, the challenge, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, how we've responded to it in terms of our end users, um, I mean, public, we, we've shared a couple of stories where we've provided tools to, to frontline, um, you know, uh, triage staff, for example, in a hospital in New York and, don't know, lots of other things, but you know we haven't used this as a kind of a ploy, uh, really, to, to get into people's hands. It's just people are identifying themselves that that that's a, you know they need certain sorts of tools, and we've just been there, sort of trying to to help out where possible. As far as the rebrand is concerned, um, I think if anything, it validates that there is a vast majority of people that are really underprepared, and it's these kind of things that that occur when they occur that they think, huh. I, I think that I have a capability gap that I need to fulfill somehow, be it through uh, gear, tools, um, nutritional, hydration type uh, preparation, uh, elimination, all, all that kind of stuff. So if anything, I think with the way we've been positioning ourselves has really been a part of, of uh, you know, making us a little bit more accessible to people that may not have considered that in the past. But I don't think it's, it's put a dampener or anything that, that we're doing and – um, you know, we've just kind of adapted and responded just as kind of going back to what I t- talked about before, just like our um, ancestors have for the thousands, hundreds, mm-hmm. millions of years um, in the past. So it's just a, another step in our adaptation and I think the resilience that, that we build up. So if anything, we've taken this as a uh, precursor to what the new normal is going to be and we're just continuously learning, learning, studying, observing, understanding, applying the, the, the the whole thing to our to what we do next studying and observing i caught yes, that <laughs> so has the rebranding and and all this um, fresh air that's come through uh has it changed the culture of the company itself um, when you were going back into it i know things are different right now but when you're in the office has it lightened the mood i don't know, i don't know how yeah. else to say it like because your knives are so like bright and and uh different and kind of, like i said there's like a a fresh air running through everything is has it changed the culture yeah absolutely like um everything you do in an organization is is cultural um and if you don't instill that culture the, the end result isn't going to be um isn't going to reflect who you are so yeah it's only changes the conversations that we have it's it starts off i mean our, our product development process is really reflective of that so certain conversations uh might start off with like Oh, I want to do a hunting knife that looks like X. And instead it's, it's more about, uh, hey, I talk to some buddies and they're into hunting and they get frustrated when they do this. And, you know, I've been thinking about this and I've, maybe I've got this idea how we can solve that. So, you know, it, it really causes the, the framework of our discussion, um, in, in the, within the company to be different. And it's really about kind of like always, why are we doing this? What problems are we solving? Are we doing it in a way that's authentic to us? And really provides a genuine response to, to, to a need. So yeah, it, it really does kind of affect 
a lot rather than just kind of a logo on a box and the geometry of a, of a tool. In, in just reading up before uh, talking to you, I got the feeling, um, and, and it only, I'm only thinking of this now, uh, but I got the feeling of like sort of a Silicon Valley. So like, let's get together, man. Let's, let's, let's all, <laughs> let's all get together and work and talk about what the greatest knives are. Like, you know, a bunch of people excited about innovating. Basically, <laughs> I kind of cringe know. a little bit because I'm thinking tech bros and I've, I've yeah, worked no, no, in the no. electronics industry and I'm kind of like, oh, not no, quite no, no. like that. <laughs> I'm just thinking of a bunch of knife nerds getting together yeah. and figuring oh, out yeah. how are we going to how are we going to make this new thing and uh, how are we going to make what we want to make and assimilate all of the feedback from from, you know, the last five years or whatever for however many years, you know, and, and turn this into something great. And you have a lot of great minds working together, a lot of minds working together. Who knows if they're all great, but they all have some great in them. I, I do, uh, you know, I work in television production. That's, that's all collaborative. And, uh, and without the expertise of everyone I work with, I'd be nothing. So um, that it's that sort of uh, innovative atmosphere I, I keep uh, thinking of. Maybe it's... Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. The, I think that the, you have typified it right. I mean, I used to work in consumer electronics where um, I was one of the um, early founders of LifeProof, which is a phone case company. Oh, yeah. And we built that up to sell it off. Kind of, it sort of, it seems like the cycle of what happens there, which um, kind of put me off Silicon Valley type startups as well, because um, I like to really invest. Uh, I see, you know, when you build a business, you're building a family. And, um, hmm. You know, I want to see its success, not just for a short term, build it up, sell it off, but rather kind of an ongoing piece. But there's lots of lessons that were learned from those experiences where you really try to get a best of breed type thinking. And even before that, before we, we did the life proof thing, um, I worked for a Raytheon company in Australia oh, yeah. where we, um, you know, my, my job was in supporting selling of missile systems and complex systems like, uh, the, the new, uh, missile destroyer and that kind of stuff. Also called the Aegis, or at least here, the, the, the uh, oh, it's it's radar. the Aegis system is yeah part of it. Yes, <laughs> uh, that, that that wasn't lost on me. Um, <laughs> so you know, I, I saw how very complex teams of teams come together to really solve something. That it's not just a um, a lone effort. That that when you bring people even outside of your your regular circles, that will challenge your thinking. You get to a better result. And sometimes you don't like being told that. Like yeah. in the certain people that, that are individualists and they want to see their vision come out. But, um, and, and I don't want to besmirch anyone, so I'm going to be kind of careful with my words, but quite often the expression of what they deliver is an expression of art as opposed to design, which is design is very purposeful. Um, you go through a particular process of solving problems to deliver a solution for those problems. So it holds us to account a lot more and um, puts a lot more pressure on us to, to deliver something that is ultimately a capability enhancement um, as opposed to just a beautiful expression of, of someone's vision. You might not want to answer this, but uh, it okay. occurs to me when you just said you have to speak carefully. If you could go out and rebrand any knife company right mm -hmm. now to your vision, and, and it could be something as, as uh, you know, as highbrow as Chris Reed Knives, or it could be, you know, Gerber or whomever, who would you love to rebrand? There's probably two brands. Uh, I'd love to see Ernie Emerson really kind of dial up his story. I think he's got a really great personal story, and I don't think that it's really reflected in, in his end product. Um, ultimately, unfortunately, a lot of us buy with our eyes, and um, his capabilities are really, I think, um, undersold in to, to get the real benefit of an Emerson, you really need to um, dive deep into the history and, and understanding and hold and use it for, for some time. So, you know, I think there's a couple of ways to kind of bubble that up. Um, and I, I'd say that kind of like on the mid size sort of business, on, on the big size business, I think Benchmade is due for a bit of a revival where they're a little, I mean, they're incredibly reputationally sound. Um, I think that they, they need a bit of a, a dialing up and a bit of a, uh, and again, <laughs> speaking carefully and very respectfully, because I know people at, at Benchmade Designers and you know, the community is very small. Um, I think they have an opportunity to really kind of potentially extend themselves and bring their promise to, to a broader uh, variety of, of end users and give people a greater benefit than um, the, the audience that is kind of maybe a little, little insular. So uh, I think those are the ones that come to mind uh, instantly. 
I think there's a lot of companies that are doing a really good job on the branding and product development and strategy side. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned Benchmade, and uh, I wanted to ask you, or I want, I wanted to compliment you or tell you that I think the XR lock is an a, an outstanding iteration of the bar lock, which was pioneered by Benchmade with the Axis lock, but has uh, gone patent free, and and uh, various companies, uh, uh, SOG included, are using it because it's an outstanding way to lock a knife open. And and if this Kiku XR is any indication, wow, it's extremely solid. And uh, so I, I have to say, excellent job with the new bar lock. And can, can I, I, hope, can I yeah. provide a slight correction there? Please, I, I apologize. Do. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> so um, the uh, Benchmade's bar lock and uh, SOG's um, arc lock were actually developed at very much the, the same time. And mm-hmm. um, they, they use slightly different approaches where Benchmade has that, 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 that bar lock straight through the, the, the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, but our XR lock actually takes elements from the, the arc lock and elements from the, the spy patent bar lock plus other mechanisms that, that we utilize and have within our portfolio that, you know, does a lot of interesting, uh, unique geometric things. But ultimately we did want to take the best of both worlds. Um, we, we have a patent for the arc lock, which people kind of say is very similar, similar to, to the axis lock, but we both developed at the same time. We had an agreement and have an agreement with Benchmade that we'll just leave each other alone. We yeah. it just happens in isolation, and that they sort of came out at the same time. Well, that, that's what I was actually getting yeah. at. I was sorry. I wasn't, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to infer that you're biting nah. off their stilo, but but nah. actually, uh, and the arc lock has been around as long as the axis lock. And I was going to ask you how the new. Um, I was I was just using bar lock as a generic term, yeah, but sure. I'm not going to yeah. I'm not going to do that now. How is no, no. the XR lock different from the arc lock? So there's a multitude of geometric changes um, that we implemented to provide a couple of different capabilities. So it's very much capability driven of what the end result was that we wanted to, to derive from it. We have a very a stronger suck back um, spring on, mm-hmm. I'm just going to hold up vision. Yep. Um, sorry for people without vision. Uh, <laughs> so just do the audio thing. Um, we wanted it so that it doesn't accidentally deploy in pocket or you know, when you drop it, that it's, the blade falls out. I mean, that, that's always that moment when you drop um, any kind of knife. <laughs> you're thinking, oh, crap, is it? In front of your boss. Yeah, oh, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to um, mitigate inadvertent opens. Um, so the, we had to adjust the geometry to be able to do that. We also uh, wanted to work with a kick. So one of the key differences is that it, it works with a kick. So the suck back spring actually helps in building up enough um, energy so that way when you use the kick it flicks out um so there's there's that kind of thing we also wanted it to be completely ambidextrous in every single iteration Mm -hmm. um so that that's sort of how that interface works but also we wanted it to not have to be worn in from the outset so when you get a a sog with an xr lock on it it's ready to go it's going to deploy first time every time the same way on and on and on and will wear with age so basically, we wanted the promise to be the same from first deployment through to hopefully never final deployment. Uh, I was uh, watching a video from 2020 uh, Shot Show, and uh, your your sales gentleman was uh, was talking about the ambidextrous nature of all, of all the knives, and he said, "This isn't because we love our lefties, which you know I'm sure you do, but it's yeah. because uh, especially especially important in the uh, in the professional class." You're 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 in a, some sort of situation where you're trying to save a life, or you're in you know hanging from a roof or whatever. You got to switch hands. You got to close that knife. You have to make sure that that's just not something you have to think about in that moment. How am I going to close this knife so that I can continue to try and save my life or this other person? So the ambidextrousness uh, of the design is important so that you can operate it with both hands easily and flawlessly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's so important to us that. It's just accessible whichever way we as humans interface with it. I mean, almost in any way that we interface with it, that we just want it to be baked in from the outset. So we have these um, benchmarks and thresholds that every single product from here on out must uh, meet. So um, being completely ambidextrous or uh, the ability to you know, change clip out or, or position its own way um, really needs to be considered regardless of more how people interface with it as opposed to whether it's left-handed or right-handed. 
use. So you'll see, you know, this come out with, with all of our future products where, you know, you talk about uh, fixed blades. So next shot show, we have a quite a, a significant um, number of fixed blades coming out that are redesigns of, of old favorites, including some that you may, may have mentioned there. Not to get it <laughs> away. Awesome. Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot of innovations that we've done on the, the sheath. I mean, quite often sheaths are sort of like, well, we'll go bend some kydex, put some eyelets through it, done, dusted, and yeah. the sheath looks like it was an afterthought because it was, <laughs> just to be very frank. Whereas the knife is beautifully sculpted, a lot of care and thinking has gone into it. So we've tried to apply that same level of consideration, uh, user insights, uh, problem solving to, to sheaths as well. So there's quite a few innovations we've, we've put into them, um, as well as the sort of the ability to kind of position it whichever way on where, where you're going to uh, hold it, house it, uh, how not just you, you know, deploy from it, but also how you retain the knife and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff going on there as well. So as you, uh, you're you on this innovation kick and you move into the future, what are in the plans or what can you tell us about? What any Anything? Can you give us a taste of any anything oh, yeah. to come? So um, we're looking to a lot of different industries to really inspire us. Um, so, you know, the worst thing you can do is start to get into this kind of like insular mode where, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of brands get criticized that, that push the boundaries of like, this is the way it's always been and therefore it has to be and kind of thing. So I respect that. And if you want that, there is someone for you that makes that. Just don't go crapping on other people's desire to, to you know, make other people better. So um, so it's weird doing a lot of looking to adjacent industries as well as uh, completely unrelated ones in terms of materials, in terms of functions and uh, technologies. And we're going to be applying that on, you know, future uh, products, but also items that you wouldn't expect to come from a knife and tool company. I mean, hmm. right now, we, we no longer really call ourselves knives and tools. Like, it used to be socks, especially knife and tool. But that's why we repositioned, repositioned to uh, Studies and Observations Group, because hmm. we, we want to offer groups of uh, solutions. And really, it's like, you know, mix and match the things that are going to make you prepared or allow you to push the boundaries of, of whatever activity that you're trying to engage in. So... You'll see um, our illumination lineup is going to be um, updated. You're going to see our packs updated. You're going to see some partnerships with with brands where it's not just a design collab of where you know we get them to draw some lines and then we laser on our, our logo on the blade or whatever it might be, but rather true collaborations where we're taking the best of what they do and the best of what we do and really creating something new. So um, there's a lot of that happening, um, I think, kicking off from next year. So. Yeah, lot, lots of uh, refreshes and lots of uh, leaps into new places. Yeah, those sound like exciting developments, especially the collaborations. Like I mentioned before, it's always great when you get a bunch of different minds together and and things come out of it that you never expected. Yeah. And, you know, beautiful things. I, I just want to say, Jonathan Wegner, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I really look forward to getting my hands on on uh, the rest of the knives, but it, especially for me personally on my short list is the Aegis and the Flash, but also the the uh, Sog Tech Sog Tac XR. Yeah. That yeah. one is a beaut. If you're familiar with with Terminus uh, XR, then this yeah. is more sort of like the the more heavy duty professional user one. Um, it's it's if you liked Kiku, I think you're really going to like Sog Tech. I'm going to need it for my hardcore lifestyle. So yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, yeah. thank you so much. Take care, sir. Thank you. You know you're a knife junkie if you're as happy as a kid on Christmas morning when that new knife arrives in the mail. Back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 112, and Bob, a good interview with Jonathan Wegner from SOG, talking mm -hmm. about uh, some of the different, uh, or not different, but the new, I guess, redesigned of some of the brands. And I just want to make sure that you're not messing up my knife. <laughs> well, it's funny because um, I am. <laughs> no, oh, what? <laughs> no, it's been sitting on my desk with other knives that I value greatly, but I have been, uh, I have been breaking it in for you, Jim. Oh, I've been breaking it guy. in for you, but Appreciate not that. not using it. And remind listeners what we're kind of joking about. Oh, okay. I, I do apologize. We got uh, a, a SOG Aegis and a SOG Flash in a package from uh, SOG. And 
I have had the Aegis and have been, I don't want to say abusing it, but using it harder than other knives in my collection just to see what this new Cryo D2 is all about and to see how robust the action is. Now, I got to say, these new knives are impressive to me in two ways. First of all, they, they took the silhouettes of these knives that have always been beautiful and then made them look beautiful when you cast light on them. You know, they took away all the, the, the overdone branding and, uh, and all of that, and they brought color, but also there's a robustness to these knives. They're, they're, I have uh, still been, not been able to introduce any play into the Aegis that I have been using, uh, nor have, uh, have I been able to bring any uh, play into your knife, the Flash, which I've just been flipping open. And uh, I got to say, the, the geometry of the, of the Aegis is awesome in both. I've been using it to, to make feather sticks uh, for, the, for the backyard fire pit. I'm trying to be like a backyard bear grills, and it's working beautifully for that. And also it cuts cheese well. Maybe I shouldn't say cuts cheese on the air, but it's uh, it's a good knife, man. I, I'm liking it so far. I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna do a final sort of review video of these knives, and then I'm gonna send you yours in the mail, Jim. And you'll you'll get that wonderful feeling of receiving a great knife in the mail. Absolutely can't uh, can't wait. Look forward to it. Bob mentioned uh, these knives and uh, reviewing them on his uh, YouTube channel. That's the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. The knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Quickly, Bob, key takeaway, a key thought uh, from the interview with Jonathan Wegner from SOG. Uh, really, my key takeaway is when things have to be reworked, uh, it doesn't mean you have to throw everything away. Sometimes things just need to be reworked, need to be adjusted, need to be th- thought through differently. As, as, so, as, a, as an online person, I, I really love likes to say, sit on the edge of your bed and really think about what you're doing. And it'll come to you. And you'll realize, for instance, the Aegis is a great knife. All we need to do is do this, this, this. Better materials, better build, different look. Boom. Great knife. All right. There you go. Mic drop or knife drop. (laughs) And wrap it up. Do want to ask you uh, one favor if you've enjoyed this podcast and enjoying all the podcast. uh, Love for you to uh, please share it with a friend. Tell somebody about it. Tweet about it. Post it on your Facebook. Send an email. Tell somebody in person if you uh, if your jurisdiction is uh, at that point where you're uh, getting back open, reopening America. But uh, again, right now, still kind of keep that social distance in mind. However, you can tell someone about the Knife Junkie podcast. We certainly do appreciate your support. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, saying thanks for joining us on Episode 112 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, TheKnifeJunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at TheKnifeJunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.